Good morning. Great to be here and to share uh, God's word. Can I reiterate what Pastor Sam has mentioned about Christmas in the Square? Um, I think it's the one opportunity. I only speak for five minutes to share the gospel, but it's between six and seven thousand people. Half of them are non believers who don't normally come to church. And so we think putting in 30, 35 grand to reach our community to our largest event, outreach event, is so worth it. And you may not be a business person, but you may want to make a donation um, towards cover. It's about 30, 35 grand. I think we, we need about 10, I think we're 10 short, and we just don't want it to wreck our budget for the year. So if you want to make a donation towards that, then let us know on your response card, the Connect card, and uh, that, will, that will help enormously. I had uh, a group of pastors from around Australia for 24 hours from Friday lunch through to really last night. Uh, we call the 200 plus pastors. So I meet um, with uh, our CRC denominational family, the ministers that have got larger churches, uh, four to 500 plus, and then I meet with those who have uh, churches of 200 plus. And the aim is to skill them and to encourage them how they can grow their churches to become around 400 if that's the will of God for them. So uh, we had a group, some of them have gone back to their services, their, their, their states, but we have today, who do we have here? Is Phil Tong here? Where are you, Phil? Oh, Phil Tong, Pastor Phil Tong from uh, Ballarat Church, CRC, and his two mates, uh, Nick and uh, Prashant, and we have uh, Jeremy Campbell from Narandra. This Narandra church has 5,000 people, the town. The church has around 300 people. The pastor, Trevor Murphy, who's on our national executive, he's regarded as the pastor of the town. The cops come to him, the council comes, everyone comes to him. They've got the largest building in town, an old theatre, and uh, it's used by thousands of people every week, hundreds of people. And Jeremy is the assistant pastor there, and it's great to have him here. And also Steve Rand from Griffith Church. Uh, so guys, would you like to stand? And Christian families, stand. Let's give them a Christian family stand. Welcome. <laughs> Say hello to them. Some of the others have gone to other churches and some have gone back, so it's just uh, great to have you guys here. Um, the oldest member of our church has turned 95 years of age and she's getting ready for another 10 years. Yeah. So Meg Mitchell, are you hiding at the back? <laughs> Happy 95th. If you know Meg, she hasn't missed a trick mentally and also uh, communication wise. She's one of the strongest women that I know and she's still got the fire in her bones and if you cross her, she'll fix you up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Meg, the body might not be as, as strong as it was but uh, we love and esteem you and we're just thrilled that uh, you're a part of our church community and your worth and value to the church. You may not be doing a lot of physical stuff, but your prayers, your faith, your generosity is legendary. So afterwards, my wife has a huge cake that she's got. At the back, we're going to have a special table for Meg. You're welcome to come and, and just wish her happy birthday. We're going to sing a song to her as well. God bless you, Meg. Fantastic. Put your hands together for her. <clears throat> Responding to Jesus, the Christmas story. What an amazing story. What an array of characters. You couldn't have made it up. Only God. And uh, you see, God, all of a sudden, there's activity taking place. There's lots of movement. And uh, there's angels. There's the Holy Spirit. There's, there's God at work. And there's a whole bunch of people. And you see them either reacting to God and pushing him away or running away or they are responding to God and drawing close to him. And so uh, these characters are fantastic. I love thinking about them and imagining myself back there of how they're, how they're thinking and operating at this time. So one of the guys is Zechariah. He's an old boy. Maybe as old as Meg. Maybe. He's John the Baptist's dad, but he's got no kids. And so his wife is, is fairly old and, and God wants a baby born through them and he wants a baby born 
through a teenage girl. There's an old man and there's a, an, an old girl and a young girl. And so Zechariah's son is John the Baptist. He, he is, and, and Elizabeth, so he is the forerunner. He is the one that's come to announce that finally the God of the Old Testament who gradually has been revealing himself is now going to turn up himself. And no more religious ceremonies and no more people thinking they know what he's like. God himself is turning up. And when you look into his eyes and you hear what he says, you know exactly what God is like. So religion is going to be dealt with and a genuine relationship with him of love and trust is going to be birthed. And so this little boy, this little baby that's got to be born, has got to take away the sin of the world. He's got to die on a cross uh, for your sins and all of our personal mistakes so that we can be reconciled to God the Father who's perfect, we're imperfect, our sins block us, God cannot look upon sin. His son's going to take our sin so that when he looks at us, he says, you're forgiven. And you're restored on the basis of my son who came to earth to reveal me, to die in, in your place, to take your sin. And so this is an amazing story, the incarnation. I think it was, um, um, was it President Richard Nixon when, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and Buzz Aldrin and these guys, the president made this statement, stupid statement, but he, he said this, he goes, this is the greatest day since creation. He's trying to be spiritual. This is the greatest day since creation. And Billy Graham turns up, no, Mr. President, it isn't. The greatest day has been when Jesus came to earth, the incarnation. Yeah. Hey, yeah. that's true. So prophets of God are allowed to tell off the presidents and prime ministers if they, if they say stuff that's not true. The greatest day in all human history was when God visited the planet. There can be no crucifixion. There can be no resurrection. There can be no salvation unless God visits the planet and is born, the eternal son is born and becomes fully human to identify with us as sinful humanity, and yet he himself was never sinful, but tested and tried in every way. And so the, 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 the story, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and please read it, our readings right now, what are we up to, chapter 2? Chapter 3, oh it's 3rd of course, yeah. So uh, chapter 3 of Luke, our, our readings are fantastic. So Jeremiah, an angel appears to him, and his name is Gabe. There's Mick and Gabe, who are the two angels that are named, that are, walk, that are there in heaven, and they tend to be the ones that when, when there's a special intervention and God wants, it's not a junior angel, it is the big boys. So Gabriel turns up and uh, starts speaking to Zechariah, and he turns up and starts speaking to this little teenage girl. And so Zechariah, he says, Zach, you're going to become a daddy. And uh, your wife, yep, that old girl, she's going to get pregnant. And John the Baptist, John is going to be his name. You've got to call him John. Anyway, he balked at this. And he kind of reacts to it in, in uh, fear, a fear reaction. And he's gripped by fear. You read the story. And he becomes paralyzed by doubt. And this is what he says to the angel. How can I be sure of this? Interesting. I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Doubt leads to unbelief, which is the opposite to faith and obedience, which is the response that God is looking for in him and Mary, and it's the response that he looks for in us when he starts moving upon our lives, when he starts revealing himself to us. I love Hebrews 11 where it says, and without faith it is impossible to please God. You cannot touch God. God cannot touch you unless there's a faith response where you throw yourself upon him, where you seek him, where you put your trust in him. And there, there is a measure of risk when God calls, out, calls us to step out in faith. So you can spell faith, R-I-S-K. So we can never be 100% sure. So, so Zechariah saying, how can I be sure of this? Revealing his doubt, which led to unbelief. You can't be 100% sure that what God says is actually going to come to pass. <laughs> you can't have the evidence before you believe. And so uh, he gives us guidance and he gives us promises. And these can only be realized by trusting him and obeying him. Abraham, the father of faith, you know, the guy who started the Hebrew nation, you can read it in Genesis 11, uh, he personifies faith and obedience. It says this, by faith, Abraham 
when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know he was going. So he's going, going, where am I going? God's spoken. I've got to obey. I've got to trust. So God didn't tell him the next step until he arrived to a place, and then he starts revealing more to him. And so this man is, is, is an amazing man of faith. Zechariah bolts. And so look at what the angel says to him. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel, just by the way. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. This is great news. This is fantastic news, you grumpy old man. This is like the best news in all the world. Heaven's been waiting for this. The prince of heaven's going to visit the planet, and you're going to produce a boy that's going to be the forerunner. You're going to be the herald. You're going to say, hey, announcing his, his coming. And now, you're going to be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. Now, now this is not God saying, you don't trust me, I'm going to judge you, I'm going to strike you dumb. So if anyone loses their speech during this message and they go out and they can't speak, it's not because God is judging you or condemning you, okay? Something medical's happened and you need to see a doctor. So... I think, trying to think through what the heck's going on is the tradition of of the Hebrew people is that you name your kids after your daddy and your mummy. Okay, a really big deal. It's a really big deal. And he's got to name his kid John. You're going to call him John. John? Like I've got to call him Judah or Simeon. No, 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 you've got to call him. And I think he balked at that. And you might think it's not a big deal. Let me tell you, in Greek culture, it's a big deal. I am named, my name is Vasilis, and I am named after my grandfather, who I never met. My sister is named Carleen after my grandmother on dad's side, whose name was Carleen, Calliope. My other sister, her name is Valerie Vasilia, she's named after the other grandmother. And if there's another son, he'd be called Dimitri. And so, like, it's inconceivable in Greek culture that you would name your kids anything else but your, your parents' names and your... It's like, so when my Joel was born, most of you know, I'm not married to a Greek. One of the negatives of intermarriage. (laughs) There's a clash of cultures. So Anglos are really difficult to live with. (laughs) So anyway, here comes this boy. And she loves the name Joel. So we had to... I had to, we called him Joel. I, I gave in to my wife. Can you believe that? I did that. And we called him Joel Stamatis after my dad. Well, my dad didn't talk to me for six months. <laughs> Punishment. Like, it was a really big deal. And then to cap it all off, Joel, when he grows up, he goes, oh, Dad, I think I'm going to change my name. To what? Stamatis. <laughs> I'm there, well... I said, do, do what you want. And uh, so... It's a big deal in some ethnic cultures. It was a mighty big deal in Hebrew culture. And he's, and he's got to call this boy John. John, Bill, Fred. What kind of name is that? You need a Hebrew name. You need a name after your family. And so I think that's how I see it. I, I, I think he's balking at this. He's doubting God. And so the angel says, okay, no talkies. And then it's, <laughs> and interestingly, have a look how he gets his voice back in... Um, because old Zechariah, he comes through at the end. He's, he's a good bloke. He's just a bit old. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Everyone's like, what? John? That's not your dad's name. That's not your granddad's name. His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was set free, and he began to speak, and he started praising God. So he comes through, and um, uh, he, he's a good guy. But you see his response is one more of doubt, fear, doubt, unbelief. And uh, it's not like Mary, Jesus' mum's response. The angel appears to her. And you know what she says? She goes, wow, we, you're kidding me. This is my interpretation. She doesn't say, how can I be sure of this? She just goes, she questions and goes, you know what? My mummy told me about the birds and the bees, but she didn't tell me this bit. 
She goes, how will this be? She, see, questioning and being curious is not doubting. Like Zechariah. So Mary asked the angel, she goes, well, how's it going to happen? Because I think I know how babies are made, unless mum held something back. So she says, I'm a virgin. And uh, like, I've, I've, I've known no man. Um, I've never had sexual relations with a man. So it's a most legitimate question that she asks. She doesn't ask in unbelief. And I see this Mary, the angel, the angel loves her. He doesn't even hang around. He just says, this girl, full of faith. She responds to God. Whereas with Zechariah, he's got to hang around for quite a while until the old boy finally signs the name John. Then the angel goes. But with Gabriel, he says, this kid, she is fantastic. She knows how to respond to God. She is a lightning rod for the presence and the power and the provisions of God. She's been preparing her heart for a long time. We don't know how old she is. She might be 13, 14, 15, 16. We're not too sure. And so I see with, with, with Mary that she makes herself available to God. And this is way before the angel intervened. She says to the angel, I'm the Lord's servant. So she actually goes, I'm just a kid. I'm a slave. I'm a servant. She's young in the mid-teens and seemingly insignificant, but not to God, our heavenly dad. Mary isn't a neutral vessel. She had already made up her mind to serve God's purposes. When that happened, I don't know. It might have been in kids' church. It might have been a Sunday school teacher in the local synagogue that somehow got through to her with some of the writings of Deuteronomy or Joshua. But this kid, she knows the scripture. So there must have been somebody that impacted her life, her mum, her dad, her, her, her cousins, or, or the people teaching her the scriptures in the synagogue as she's growing up. And so she, is, uh, she knows the word like you've got to believe. And uh, uh, she's been preparing herself. She's memorized scripture. When she does her song, you know, Mary's uh, Magnificent. That song, 19 references in, from the Old Testament impregnate that song. And so she's, she's worshipping God in response. She hasn't got time to say, oh, I think I'll compose a song. Uh, where's that bit in Leviticus or that bit in Deuteronomy? It pours out of her. She has already read herself full and prayed herself hot. She's full of the word of God. And so she has imbibed the word into her life as a young kid. No wonder she becomes a lightning rod. She's made herself available to God. She's prepared her heart before him. No wonder the Lord selected her to, to, to come and say, you're going to be the one that's going to carry the eternal son for nine months and you're going to look after him as a baby and as a little boy and as a teenager and as a young man. And so uh, she, she's, she's, she's fantastic. See, God loves to work through ordinary people like you and me. He really does. Who will make themselves available to him. That's what Mary's teaching us. He wants to use you. Just make yourself available to him. He doesn't look for great ability. He looks for availability. And then if you can just start preparing your heart, so, so will you make yourself available to Jesus today? That's what Mary teaches us. Make yourself available to him and you don't know what could take place. Angels, miracles, Holy Spirit could start moving and if you're ready, you don't know what God could do in and through you. So let's make ourselves available for God's purposes and prepare ourselves by, by really ingesting the amazing words of God, words of hope, words of faith, words of love. Secondly, she receives the promise of God. Mary humbly accepts what God wants to do in and through her. She just humbly accepts it. She's an amazing girl. Despite, hear me on this one, the immense problems it's going to cause both her and her fiancé and her family. I mean, she's saying yes to problems with a big P. Trouble with a big T. And she's not stupid. She knows the consequences of what's going to take place. This, is going to, this could wreck her marriage, her betrothal to, to, to Joseph. This could ostracize her from her family. They say, just keep away. This could cause her death because adultery was a capital offense and you could stone a person legally. And in some countries in the world today, the act of adultery is a capital offence. In Saudi Arabia, they will behead you if you commit adultery. That'll keep you on the straight and narrow, won't it? Man. 
It's so serious in some Islamic cultures. Dear Martin Luther, I love him heaps, but he actually said, you know what, to the state, you know, we did a series on Luther, he says, yeah, look, adultery, I think that should be punishable by death. Yeah, keep that up. He goes, we've got to stop all the prostitution. We've got to stop all the adultery. We've got to stop all these illegitimate kids. He goes, yeah, probably it's the best thing. He advised the princes. That's in the 1500s. I'm not saying that we should do that. In fact, Jesus taught against capital punishment indirectly and said, hey, you've got to find a way of restoring and forgiving and, and, and transforming people and seeing them making amends. But in this culture, she, this girl, she receives the promise and there's trouble with a big T coming around the corner. She says this, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. It's like Gabriel says, I'm done. She's terrific. What a heart for God. What a faith response. Oh man, she, she is truly a lightning rod for the presence power. Of, hey, it's going to happen. He loves her. He just takes off. See, God's call on our lives will cause some problems for us, as well as releasing many blessings upon our lives. The four Gospels are full of it. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'd be lying to you to say, come to Jesus and receive the gift of salvation and forgiveness and eternal life, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. No, your family may oppose you. No, there may be friends that say, you know what, I don't want to be your friend anymore. And they say, nah. We're not religious. There may be people that, that ridicule you. Very rare is their physical persecution today, but by golly, I reckon psychological persecution is worse than physical persecution. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I don't think that's true. I'd sooner get a whack from somebody than to be verbally abused or to be my soul, my inner life, to be cursed by, by words. Of, of indifference or words of hatred or words of separation or words of rejection. And so, you know, the four Gospels, it says, many people believed on Jesus, but few followed. And even fewer were committed disciples. Commitment, that word. You can't be a Christian without commitment. And that means your time, your treasure, your talents. We receive salvation by believing upon his cross and what his cross accomplished. But you can't be a disciple until you take up your cross, deny yourself to serve the best interests of Jesus and his expanding kingdom. I know people say, I'm committed to Jesus, but they won't serve him. I'm committed to Jesus, but I hate church. Eh? How can you say, love me, but you hate my kids? Love me, love my kids. The church is his bride. It's his body. It's his army. It's, it's, it's just a euphemism to say, I'm actually backslidden. I say, I, I, I love Jesus. No, you don't. You don't love Jesus if you hate people. You can't love Jesus and say, I, I, I hate his church. His church is people like you and me. And we're all sinners saved by grace. And he calls us to serve his purposes through the church and through our vocations. And so a disciple is a committed one. You serve. You serve and, and you, it takes up time and, it, and, and, and you treasure and your talents and you say, you know what, I want to serve his purposes because I've received the benefits of his cross. The, the logical thing is I'm going, to, I'm going to take up my cross, deny myself and follow him as a disciple. But you know, it's very few, very few make it. Some of them just said, you know what, we love you, Jesus. We love the healings. We love the miracles. We love the provisions. But you know... That was a really hard thing you said. You know, see, ya. it's just a bit hard. I'm going back to mummy and daddy, to my comfortable life. And, and uh, you know, I just, I just, I just want to be a private believer, just between me and God, this public testimony and winning. And No, 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 no. And they went away. They left him. Terrible. Incredibly sad. God could be so close and yet so far from people. What is it with... Let's say this front row. There's two people sitting there. There's a space between the two of you, but let's say there's two people there. And I've seen it. There's a person there, and they're like, God, they're worshipping tears. They, they, they're responding. Another person sitting there. Same event, music, worship. When's this thing finishing? <laughs> I'm really hungry, you know, like, like God's all over that person. And I don't know what's on that person, but it seems like nothing. So what is that? Is God fickle? No, no, God is here. 
but it's how we respond to him. And so you look at Nazareth. I mean, in Nazareth, they knew Jesus for 30 years. He's the carpenter. Nazareth has about 50 people in the town. It's a big city now. I've been there. Nazareth, it's, a, it's a little town, and his dad's the carpenter. Dad dies. That's Joseph, his earthly dad. He becomes the carpenter. Everyone knows that the tables, the chairs, the, the carpentry stuff is all done by Jesus. They know him. He's caused no trouble. Yet he starts out in ministry, and he basically says, well, he, he actually says, I'm unique and exclusive. Actually, I'm God among you. Now, they, they just wanted to kill him. They grabbed him. So who do you think you are? You're the carpenter. Now you're saying you're God in human form? Get out of here. They took him to a cliff to throw him off. God is close to them. Yet their response is one of hatred and rejection and to silence them. Two towns on the coast of, uh, uh, on the lake of Galilee or Tiberias. And I've been there too, Gadara and Gennesaret. The towns aren't there. They're about 15, 20 k from each other. So there's two towns... The Gadarenes, a miracle happens, an amazing miracle happens. A man who's demonised, mentally ill and demonised, gets amazingly healed. And the people, you know what they do with Jesus? They run him out of town. They see the miracle. Just down the road, the place of Gennesaret, they hear about it. And they hear about Jesus coming near them. You know what they do? Without even seeing a miracle, they hear that he's coming into town. They start running after him, begging him, come to us. They reject you in Gadara, come to us. And it says miracles, amazing provisions took place as these people responded to him in Gennesaret, whereas in Gadara they pushed him away. You can read that story in Mark chapter 5 and chapter 6, amazing. I look at creation and I I just get wowed by creation. I mean, grab grab a book, grab a Ken Duncan book. And look at the amazing, beautiful photographs of creation. You see colours and light and flowers. And and it's like, I love watching the sunrise at my home when I get up early and Kathy's still asleep and I just open up the curtains by the swimming pool there and I just have my Bible just sitting there and I wait for the sun to rise. Oh, it's beautiful. And the sun set. It's like God saying, good morning, Bill. I'm around. Have a look how beautiful it is. And at night, before you go to sleep, I think I'll just do another little painting that's different to last night's. And you look at it and you go, wow, that is awesome. When you see some of the amazing beauty of what God has done. I I see God so clearly, so unmistakably in creation. In others, you know what they see? Well, just chance probabilities matter like yeah yeah we had to all come together yeah we well, think about 16 billion years ago we just this thing called the big bang occurred bang who knows what the big bang is no one knows they reckon it was this small the little cell who put it there no one knows and it just went a thermonuclear reaction boom 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 and then seven billion years later somehow the earth came around the solar system, around the sun, the right distance. So a bit too close, you get cooked. A bit further away, you freeze. Then somehow all these gases appeared. And then there was this little amino acid, a bit of chemical. No one knows where it came from. And uh, somehow it found itself with another chemical. And another chemical, the amino, and it became a molecule of protein. Ha! Life. And then uh, throw in another... Seven billion years, and you got me. <laughs> Give me a break. That's as stupid as me saying, see this wristwatch? Give me a hammer. Oh, there's some jewelers here, they won't like this. Give me a hammer, and I'll smash it up. Not just that. So there's, say, a thousand bits of metal. Give me a grinder. I'm going to break it down into its particles. So there's 10 million little dust particles and that's all that's there. Just give it enough time. Uh, when I was at university, it was actually 4 billion years. Now it's 14 billion years. Okay, give me... No, I think it was 7 billion the Big Bang and 4 billion was the Earth. 
just give it enough time. So if, if another scientist comes up, it'll probably be 20 billion in another, and you end up with this with enough time. Yeah, sure. You've got to have unbelievable naivety to believe there isn't a plan and a purpose, that there is a master creator that put it all together. And uh, you can be a scientist, and I did my sub-majors in science. I love science. But I argued with the professors. I said, you don't believe that stuff, do you? I said, I don't believe that stuff. It's hopeless. I said, and they said, well, if you're going to be a teacher, you better teach it. I said, I'll teach it. I'll teach it to the kids and make sure they're passed. I'll tell them I don't believe it. It's a whole pile of, anyway. So I don't believe that stuff. It's unbelievable. You've got no evidence for that. It's a model. Don't talk about it being a theory. It's a model. It's a view. I have another model. God is there and he made it. So you see, how you view life. The Nazarenes, God is among them. They want to kill him. The Gadarenes, God is among them. They want to push him away. The Gennesarets want to run after him. Creation. You can say time, chance and matter. That's all it is. You know, like there's nothing, there's nothing there. Or you can say, no, no, there's a personal God. And so God can be so close to us and yet so far from us. He is really close to you right now. But you might say, but Bill, I, I don't feel him. Well, I don't care whether you feel him or not. The truth is he is right there with you. He is right there with you. He walks up and down these aisles. You can't see him through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is here, not physically. He loves you. He has plans for you. I shared last week about what Jesus is doing in heaven. He ain't twiddling his thumbs thinking, well, what am I going to do tomorrow? He's actually praying for you even when you don't pray to him. He's thinking of you even when you don't think about him. He's always talking to the Father saying, I love him, help them. Holy Spirit, touch them. He, he, he is always working sovereignly to see good come in this world that we live in where there's so much evil. God is so close to us and yet so far away from us when we act like a Zechariah or a Gennesaret people or the Nazarene people. Or he can be so close when we respond to him and make ourselves available and we receive the promises that he has for us. Thirdly, she believed and placed her trust in him. Have a look at this verse 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. This is Elizabeth. Now, this is the old girl that has John the Baptist. So Mary goes to her and stays there because, and again, we think probably her family are going nuts over this little girl that's pregnant. Not socially acceptable. So who does she go to? Elizabeth, who's a beautiful, a beautiful cousin, a wonderful friend, older lady. And she recognized that God's doing something here. Blessed is she. Mary, you're blessed because you believe that the Lord's going to fulfill his promises to her. So she recognizes Mary's strong faith. Mary did not pull back in fear and doubt like Zechariah. And Elizabeth was a witness to that. Mary's faith response is the one that God waits to hear from all of us. He wants this faith response in us. So she believes and places her trust in God. And, and we, we can place our trust in God today. We're going to take communion together, symbols of the death of Christ. And as you eat it and drink it, you can do it as a ceremony. So, oh, that's a nice religious thing to do. Or you can do it with faith and say, God, I need your presence. I need your power. I need your provisions. I need this miracle. I need your intervention. And when you, when you do it with faith and put your trust in him and his promises, he will come through for you. And then she worships God, her saviour, with all her heart. I mean, she's a fantastic girl. And Mary does this even though she doesn't know what Joseph's response is going to be. And I'll talk about Joseph next week. He's a, he's a fabulous man. He's a true gentleman. In fact, he initially thought, I'll, I'll put her away quietly. He loved her. He could have had her stoned. He would have been terribly embarrassed. How do you explain it to your parents? Actually, she's pregnant, mum and dad. And I'm not the dad. So he wanted to put her away quietly until God intervenes with him because of his integrity of heart. But anyway, it would have been hot, so she goes to Elizabeth for quite a few months there until the baby's ready to be born. And, uh, but he doesn't put her away. He could have had a stone, as I mentioned. He could have had a stone. 
She's a fabulous example, Mary, about being grateful to God our Father. And she praises him even in the most difficult situation, the most unusual circumstances. This is weird stuff happening. This is, you can't make this story up. On a, on a, on a, when you read it, this is weird. A little girl, God, psh, pregnant. God the, of the universe trusts a teenage girl with his presence. So the eternal son becomes an ovum, one cell in her womb. Not caused by a man, but caused by God and her. So he's fully human and he's fully God. That's weird. I don't understand that, how that's possible. But it's real. So in the midst of she kind of coming to grips with this, and also the ostracism by her family and the difficulties that, that are taking place, not knowing what Joseph's going to do, she starts worshipping. I mean, like she's a worshipper. And like I said, 19 phrases of Old Testament fragments of books are in this. And look at, look at what she says. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. Isn't this great? And my spirit, I just rejoice in God my saviour. For he has looked on me, and I'm just a humble little kid. And behold, from now on, everyone's going to call me blessed. And I deserve it. For he is... For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. What a worshipper. And look at this one. This is for you. And she sings this and she writes or she prays this. And his mercy is for those who fear him or those who respect him. Those who submit to him. Those who put their trust in him. Those who make themselves available to him. Those who believe his word. Those who respond to him. In, in love and obedience and trust, it goes, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. See, Mary saw Jesus arrive as her baby son and she watched him die on a cross as her saviour. And Mary was also in the upper room as one of the 120 disciples, 50, 40 days after the resurrection of her son from the dead. She's on her face calling out to God the Father that she would become born again. That the risen Christ, her baby boy, through the Holy Spirit would be reborn in her spirit. Isn't that amazing? She who gave physical birth to Jesus is now crying out to him saying, I want more of Jesus. I don't want to get pregnant again. I, I want to be reborn. I want the risen Christ, my, my, this, this Jesus. By his Holy Spirit, I want, I want the Spirit. I want more of God in my life. What a girl, what a woman. Now she's in probably 45. So she wants to receive Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit. She who was used by God the Father to supernaturally bring Jesus into the world now wants this risen Christ to be a permanent part of her spiritual life. What a woman. What a person of faith. No wonder she's one of the most respected people of, of the scriptures. And I think we, we just got to follow Mary's example. We need to follow her example and to seek to make more room in our lives for Jesus. So let's all respond to the voice of, of Jesus today and his presence here. And may he come through for you with great provision. Don't be a doubter. Be a a person who wonders. Make yourself available to him. Receive the promises that he has. The scripture's full of them. Believe and place your trust in him and, and then worship him as your saviour. Let's pray together.